So, all right, welcome everyone. We're really excited to have you here. Uh, thank you for coming to what we're calling Beyond the Classroom, uh, you know, exploring some opportunities uh, in the professional learning development world. So we're gonna get to it here. Uh, everybody's already doing it on mute camera on and please use the chat we will uh we're all very avid uh, video meeting hosts facilitators this is kind of a big part of what we all do especially this for on the call every day so jump in this time is for you we've got a a, a good bunch kind of an bunch here and um you know if you have questions please don't hesitate uh we're not here to necessarily ch talk and chat but we're here to answer your questions and make sure you understand what's going on here so all right, we're going to dive right in. All right, our first question to the chat, uh, what is driving you to explore options outside of the classroom? So why are you here, essentially? Um, is it just a basic curiosity? Is there something specific going on? I'll speak freely about my past. Uh, we had a massive district changeover um, when I was teaching and just the way that we had operated and uh, just was going away. So a lot of the freedom that I thought I was going to have as a teacher or had been used to as a teacher was kind of disappearing. So that was that little nudge to look outside. So I know we got, it looks like everyone's typing, which is good. There's, there's going to be some deep answers here. Yeah. Well, as we uh, wait for some responses to come in, I'm going to pop right back here. Here we go. So this is Zach, the unsustainability and the workload. Yeah, uh, work all day, great all night. That can get to you. Uh, something you'll hear us talk about a little bit on today is the day-to-day the -day grind of a teacher having to be on all day can get to be too much. Uh, yeah, here's a big, you know, Jeremy, so it wasn't, wasn't for me for life. So let's see, Mary, uh, I want to use my degree in instructional design and technology which is coming in August. Uh, I only spent one more, one year in the classroom and it was not a great fit. A right. mm. couple other answers here. Work-life balance for sure. Jack, I know how busy. Uh, again, Jack's a friend of mine, but uh, at a school, it's a very competitive athletic school. Being a music teacher keeps you very, very busy. Uh, let's see, this is from Ryan. Path is leading me from serving students to serving organizations. All right. A uh, long one to answer from Ani. <laughs> I love being an educator and want to do something different and to be paid more and have that work-life balance. Agreed, yeah, I also, I also identify with that. And thank you for all the other responses. We're gonna to try to get into these. Um, we got a lot, of so we'll, we'll thank you very much. Um, so our goal for today's conversation, you know, we just wanna explore opportunities for educators in the world of professional learning and development. So what is the world of professional learning and development? How might you fit into that world? So again, conversation, please, uh, Pipe in whenever you feel like you have a question. Um, quick agenda, we've already done our welcome. We're gonna do a quick introduction of who we are. Zach's gonna lead us through what is L&D. Jeremy's gonna lead us through a week in the life. I'm gonna kind of talk about how some of the skills transfer. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about tier one and we'll take some question and answer and close and get everybody out of here. So got a tight little agenda for you. So quickly, uh, Anna, she's on the phone, Anna Oscaris. We've got Jeremy Goble. Uh, my name is Joe Janigan. I'll be the host for today. And of course, we've got the wonderful Zach Ryland. You're gonna learn about each of them in just one moment. We all work at tier one. We're all current consultants uh, and we're all former educators. So we have um, some perspective to share. Maybe we've been down a similar path. Um, so we're gonna just kick it right off and dive into Anna's gonna tell us a little bit about herself and what she's doing lately. Hey, everybody. Uh, if I haven't met you yet, it's nice to meet you. And for those of you I have met, it's good to see you again. My name's Anna Oscaris, and I've been with Tier 1 for nearly 15 years. Uh, started my, um, my career as an educator, elementary, um, five years in northern Pennsylvania. And I really loved being a teacher, but I, you know, I started to explore, like, what else was out there. So, you know, you have to get your credits to keep your certification active. I started looking into degree programs. So, got a uh, master's in instructional systems design from Penn State, you know, on my nights and weekends. If anybody's done that, you know, it's, it's grueling, but it's worth it, you know. And, and so, after I got that, I um, made that crossover into instructional systems work. Um, 
we wanted to share like a project that we were most proud or excited about. Um, I'm sharing a program that I worked on for Procter & Gamble, um, which is a large product manufacturing company. They make a lot of the products you probably have in your house, like um, Tide, Bounty, um, Charmin. <laughs> you probably saw something from them somewhere in your house today. Um, but uh, we, we've been helping their R&D group, that, so research and development, for years. And uh, we create programs for people that are newly promoted within R&D to help them be effective in their roles. So a program that we created was called Associate Director College. And it was one of the first programs where I was truly like leading the work myself and also being the learning strategist. So it was quite... Um, exciting, but also scary for me. Um, so uh, I, I was very proud with the way it turned out. Um, it was a, lar a large program, so we, you know, started off with a prime phase where, when people get promoted, we start them off with some things to help them be successful out of the gate, and then we brought them in in person for a three-day experience, and then we had sustained activities afterwards. So there was a lot of planning and work involved talking to people in the role, understanding what the needs were, mm -hmm. using that to craft an experience that was really going to help them be able to be effective. So I um, have great memories of that program, and uh, so I thought that was the one I would share. At the bottom, there's a little bit about our process. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the process that we use. Um, it's not all that different from probably your process when you're working through how to create a lesson. So. You know, we start off with discovering and defining what it is we're trying to accomplish. So um, understanding the content, understanding your learning objectives, designing the experience, developing it, trying it out, evaluating it, and, you know, how that is wash, rinse, repeat. Like, as a teacher, how do we refine it? How do we make it better? Um, so that's the example I wanted to share, and I'm glad to be here with you tonight. I'm going to pass it on to Jeremy, I think. Thanks, Anna. Hmm? Hey, everyone. Jeremy Goble. I taught Spanish for seven years. Um, any other Spanish teachers? Uh, language teachers? Drop it in the chat. I want to say a special shout out to you if you're a language teacher. So I did that for seven years. Um, those are the degrees there that I have. I really love learning. I would get another degree, honestly, if I weren't working and balancing family and all that. Um, been here for 10 years uh, in January, so really excited about that. And uh, yeah, project I worked on, you'll see this thing called co-creation at P&G. And it turns out that in the world of corporate America and everywhere else, sometimes people don't work together as they should. There's minor issues with collaboration and all this. Stuff. There's all these uh, words we use, but basically it comes down to, man, the basics of working together, collaborating, all these things just sometimes are missing. And for whatever reason, and then that has a ripple effect on the culture and the, uh, the, uh, the level of innovation that they expect. So I worked on this program called Co-Creation, and uh, you'll see there the assets. We created a couple of workshops you'll see, and um, all throughout there's different little interventions. So we like to say that we create experiences for people in their companies that change their mindsets and their behaviors. So that's what we're all about. So you'll see here a series of experiences um, that we put people through and kind of process. We we interviewed people. We um, we went to focus groups, built a framework, and I could talk on and on. But that's a project that I'm really excited about, and it's still going on. I'll turn it over to Zach. Oh, Joe. Oh, <laughs> Joe. Mm, Did have my presentation memorized. Prepare. All right. Um, so thank you, Jeremy. <laughs> Uh, hi, my name is Peter Janigan. Um, I was a music teacher for more than 15 years. Um, and then prior to coming to Tier 1, I was actually um, a consultant for instructional technology and I was also a teaching coach. Uh, but I got my BA in music and then later on I got my master's in secondary education. I will be at Tier 1 for two years in July. It's wild that the majority of my time at Tier 1 has been during COVID. Uh, turned out for me that was a good thing because we were doing a lot of remote, blended, asynchronous learning. And if you're a classroom teacher today, even before COVID, we were doing a lot of remote, blended, and asynchronous learning. So it was kind of cool to bring some of those tools into the more corporate world. Um, here is a bit, uh, I, I did a thing, you're hearing a lot about P&G today. Uh, it, it happens that Jeremy and I and Anna and Zach all work a lot with P&G. That's kind of how we all got to know each other. 
Um, but this is, um, I'll get to that in a second, but there's an internal organization that runs PNGs. It's kind of their, one of their innovation hubs. And we've been helping them develop and roll out a new strategy, a new vision and mission. We've been, we rebranded that. We helped them with a new kind of go to market strategy. We created videos. It's really been uh, for me, something all new, new communications plan, a new change plan, an adoption plan, uh, one small course, but a lot of all these really cool assets. And this is a shot of one of our collaborative kind of facilitated design thinking sessions. This is just a little snippet from a tool that we use called Miro and all these sticky notes eventually turn into something that looks like this. This is one of the pages in this external engagement quick guide. It's a PDF that actually acts as like a little app. Um, so these are kind of buttons down here that take you to these different links inside the PDF. Uh, it's just a really cool tool. Um, what's not, not neat about this for me, something I'm really proud of is working with other stakeholders, a lot of um, different people throughout PNG, but also with a comm strategist, a change strategist, a creative strategist inside tier one. And this is one of the first groups, I, I, things that I've been able to lead, and it's been going on for about a year and a half plus now. Uh, but you know, this the design thinking facilitation, this design sprints, um, these tests with customers and clients has been really fun. So that's a, 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 my quick ad here. Zach. Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, and guys, I'm uh, Zach Ryland. I used to be a math teacher for a handful of years. Um, one of those kind of atypical uh, career paths because I actually have a, my undergraduate degree in psychology. I've been at Tier 1 for about seven years now. So, Joe, please feel free to animate that first image on. We, really, the whole point of these introductions beyond just kind of helping you understand who we are is also to just show you how the work might be a little different. So, I spend some of my time doing um, leadership development as a space that we work a lot as instructional designers and learning strategists. That next image is from Philips Healthcare, where we're developing e-learning courses to help um, nurses get to know new monitors and new devices in a healthcare setting. And then that last image is, um, it's really just kind of zoomed out, but just to show you, it's kind of a listing of jobs, pains, gains, of um, a little bit of a value proposition. Sometimes we also get to work on the front end of new products or new services to try to help understand what customers want. So there's a, a little bit of a twist in our jobs there too. Um, just in terms of like how I've been working recently, like in the past month, um, instead of doing lesson plans and grading and assessments, I've been creating PowerPoints, participant guides, e-learning outlines or storyboards. Um, in that document, you saw customer needs and value props. And we'll do things like do customer interviews, do surveys and learning analysis. We'll do, um, if you guys are familiar with design thinking, we do that and what we call performance experience design. And then we might even run design sprints to try to quickly design solutions and do customer testing. So just a little bit, we'll get into more but about how the role is slightly different. Um, last thing I'll say before I hand it back to Joe is we probably use a lot of jargon and we don't even know it. So if there's anything mm -hmm. we say that you don't recognize, come off mute, interrupt us, or throw it in the chat and we'll certainly define it. So that is a perfect uh, tee up. When I first joined Tier 1, I actually started a Word doc that was, I, I called it consultant speak. And it was just those phrases heard around the office because these are things I just ladder up and, um, you know, uh, uh, value proposition. I didn't know what that was, or all kinds of things. It's good. That was the, a big learning curve for me, but actually a really fun one. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit, we're going to stick with Zach and we're going to learn a little bit more about the world of L&D. What is learning and development and, and how might you relate or connect to that world? Yeah, absolutely. Learning and development, I mean, just separate from the two words, um, obviously we're, a lot of times this is the phrase used for kind of an internal department. So we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm sure some of you are familiar, so if you are, we'll try to keep this brief, but if it's totally new to you, we're going to try to answer two questions. What is learning and development and kind of what is our role as professionals in learning and development when we work inside of organizations or with clients? So Joe, you can go forward. Um, so first for what is learning and development, just a high level definition. Um, Joe, you can animate. Learning and development is really just a sub-function of human resources in most businesses. And learning and development kind of supports the development and the delivery of training that just essentially supports the business. So the business says, hey, you know, if it's compliance-based, we've got to get out of training on safety. How can you help us make that? Or they may come and say, hey, we've had a lot of turnover. How could we fix that? You know, one's a little bit more ambiguous, but that's the role. Um, Joe, you can go on to the next slide. So in terms of um, what it is, it does look a little bit different in different settings. One more, Joe. Um, it can look totally different in a small organization versus a large corporation. So if you work in a learning and development department in a small organization, you're likely to be one of very few people. Maybe you're the only employee or maybe you're on a team of five. 
Um, and because of that nature, you're usually um, kind of a, a whole round um, general practitioner. You might write outlines, you might create storyboards, you might go in then into you know, a technology software and develop an e-learning course yourself, or you build PowerPoints yourself. You kind of do a little bit of everything. Um, so some people love that because they get to see the front to back you know, whole process. Other people in a large corporation are usually a little bit more specialized. So your, might, your job might just be an instructional designer to go in, um, create content, and then you hand it off to someone else. And in between, Joe, if you just kind of bring up one more, um, is a consultancy. And obviously, just based on the size of consultancy or the clients that they work with, you can be on either end of the spectrum. For tier one, we're a little bit closer to that right-hand side where, like Anna said in the chat, we've got a creative team. So I won't usually create visuals for PowerPoints. I'll hand that off to someone else. And I don't create any learning. I do more of the outlining or learning-based tasks. Joe, you can keep us going. Um, another thing to consider in a large corporation, and Joe, you can animate one more, is that um, you could be centralized or you could be kind of a line of business or department specific learning consultant. So sometimes there's a learning and development organization that serves the whole company. They just take requests. Other times you might be with a specific department. Like let's say you're working for a bank. You might be associated only with people who do mortgages. You do all the training for the mortgage department. So those are some other differences in how L&D might be structured. Joe, you can take us forward. We'll answer that other question, what's our role in learning and development? Um, Joe, you can proceed. And so for that, it probably falls into three buckets, and you can bring the first one up. Um, one is you do an instructional design, and that's probably the most common thing that relates specifically to teaching. In teaching, you know, you do unit plans, lesson plans, you do assessments. Um, instructional designers do similar things, just in a different setting. We'll still build assessments. A lot of times we'll build outlines. Um, instructional designers will take content and turn it into lessons. So that's probably the most one-to-one -one role. But very similarly, the next one is learning strategist. And while you do a little bit of this today, like Nicole, I saw you put in chat, you just love curriculum development. The very similar thing, um, learning strategists kind of work at a programmatic level. Um, they may also do some more project leadership. And beyond that, a learning strategist usually just has to deal with a little bit more ambiguous questions. So when I was a math teacher, I knew the state standards. I knew the content. Like when you leave my class, you better know parabolas. A learning strategist might be asked to help fix uh, turnover, like I mentioned earlier, or help improve time to proficiency when you're onboarding employees. How you do that is going to be a little bit more vague. So it takes a little bit more creative nature. Back and then the finally, and sorry, Joe, go ahead, I, I had a quick build. Uh, yeah, I, I, the way that was explained to me really well one time is that we're an instructional designer, there may be a lot of guardrails kind of helping you. You might have some source materials, some documents, somebody else, this is the direction you're going. As a learning strategist, you're often asked to make something from nothing or bring some vision or some point of view to the table. So it's just a little mm. more. No, I appreciate that. And again, please, any of you can come and ask questions too. Yeah, we've got a couple of good questions. More. Yeah, let me do this. And then I think Anna and Jeremy, you might want to address a couple of those. The last piece, and I call it out because in teaching today, as you know it, it's so married together with what you do. But there is the trainer and facilitator role. And, and what should be said is for instructional design, you may never, uh, depending on your, your position, your company, do the actual getting in front of people and doing the teaching and educating. So in the corporate world, that may live with a trainer or facilitator. So sometimes in a job description, you do both of those. Sometimes it's very specific. And I know large companies, you may take a job where all you do is training and facilitating. You might be on the road or just at a facility kind of day in and day out, that's your job. So if that's your favorite part about teaching, that may be something that applies to you. Well, and I would say that even if you're not actually doing the facilitating yourself, you are probably still using those skills in different ways. Mm -hmm. For example, leading meetings with clients, leading internal meetings with teams, um, presenting something that you've done to the company. So there's different ways that that can be leveraged, for mm. sure. Love that, Anna. That's a great got question, a couple... Nicole, on, uh, on does the client provide data to analyze uh, and craft it, or, or do we bring the data? So it depends. Sometimes they come to us and they say, we want, here's our pain point. We want leaders, uh, our leaders are struggling with X, empathy, being more strategic, um, being rigorous with the financials, all these things. We want a program. Okay, we'll build the program. Other times they will say, uh, for example, please create a training for uh, this payroll function that you have to do that's systems oriented. Okay, we'll have to go in and learn the system to design the 
e-learning or the video or whatever. So it happens both ways. Mm -hmm. I think, just to say it, that is sometimes the most fun of this job. There, there, there was a time right before COVID in 2019 where I spent an afternoon in the underbelly of an aircraft learning how luggage handlers throw our luggage across and, and load it up in a plane because we needed to create a training on it. So you get to experience, if you're a lifelong learner, a lot of things more than just the one subject that you've mastered or the couple subjects that you master as a teacher. Yeah, it keeps it fresh. I, I like that part of the role because it, you just kind of get to learn about different industries and it does kind of enrich your life because then you understand things around you that you might not have ever looked at before. That's right. But, oh my gosh. Yes. If you look, why well, I should say it, I, I did. You have to love learning. You have to love learning. If you don't love learning, consulting is not for you. I just say that because you will be expected to learn a lot and stuff that you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. I did not know what peritoneal dialysis was. <laughs> After a year of it with DeVita dialysis, I was like, I hope I never have to have peritoneal dialysis. But like it was, it's just you immerse yourself in the worlds of people in these roles so that you can design effective experiences for them. Um, mm -hmm. That payroll, boy, that was some really fun training. But <laughs> I never learned about I-9 compliance and verification before. So anyway, keep going. <laughs> Joe, you um, can breeze through the animations here because Anna's already kind of talked to this. But just oh, to sorry. say, no, no. <laughs> In, in a good way. It's like, still a thunder. <laughs> you made the connection that as a trainer and facilitator, you know, sometimes you are a trainer and facilitator of content, which is very much like teaching today, but maybe you're doing it on payroll mm -hmm. in front of a room. Mm -hmm. um, you could also be a trainer or facilitator, facilitator of meetings or of process where you're guiding the group. You're using a lot of those same, like Anna said, stand-up teaching skills, but just in a different setting, not so much for content. All right, Joe, I'll hand it back to you. And guys, please keep with the chat um, or come off mute, please. We've got a small crowd so we can have a conversation. Yes, Nicole, absolutely. You have to. Uh, and there's a couple other questions that came in about collaboration with Creative. And we'll talk about that kind of right here now. So actually, Anna's going to talk us through a little bit of one. Yes. So uh, this is our, uh, our method for how we approach learning projects. And uh, I mentioned this a little bit earlier when I was talking about the project example, but uh, it's got underpinnings of the ADDIE model. I, um, that's a very basic approach to instructional systems design. Like if you search it, you'll find like it kind of has its foundations in um, I think military, like back in like the 1940s, 50s. We've made enhancements to it and kind of made our own proprietary version of it. Um, I think like some of the things that are different about the way we approach projects is that we definitely um, get the whole team, a cross-functional team together at the front end and we're very collaborative in the way that we work. So in some organizations, like a learning person might work by themselves and just kind of design in isolation and then toss it over the fence and somebody's there to like decorate it. Like that's not the way that we work. We work together to think about like a vision for like what we want to try to accomplish for the learner. And then we all work together on that vision to bring it to life. And this process really kind of helps us to reduce risk throughout the project. There's checkpoints along the way. So we will have something that we create as a result of each of these phases. We check in with our client, we get validation and approval so that we can make sure we're on the right track. And that really helps to minimize us going in the wrong direction and having costly rework. So um, discovers the first phase, you know, Zach and Jeremy were talking about, you know, you talk to your learners, you, fi you find out, you know, what their needs are, what motivates them, what's the right kind of intervention. You talk to the leaders of those people. What does the business need? What's the intersection of those things? And what's the right type of learning experience to create? And so that's the defined piece. It's like, take all those things you learned, figure out exactly what you're trying to accomplish. You write your learning objectives. You then move on to design that experience that you're going to create. You, um, you know, if you're doing e-learning, you might create or, uh, storyboards, write storyboards. If you're doing instructor-led training, so like in-person or virtual, you might be writing a facilitator guide. So thinking through like, what does the facilitator need to know? Um, what are the actions they need to take? What are the activities you think that would be right to get accomplished learning objectives? So you're developing all of that stuff, all the content, the assets, and then we move on to deploy. 
oftentimes we're prepping our clients to deploy whatever it is we're designing. Um, we have like people like Zach and Joe and Jeremy who are fantastic facilitators, so they're often called upon to actually deliver content, um, but that's not always the case. Um, and so it just depends on the situation. Sometimes that can be like it's 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 hard as a teacher because you you know you really used to design your own things and see them come to fruition and see how it plays out and you learn from it. You don't always get to do that. I think um, some clients are willing to invest in the evaluation piece and allowing us to be a part of it. That doesn't always happen. So uh, you know I think it just depends. But um, it, it you know it still has a lot of rewarding parts to the process, I think that you you would get um, satisfaction from as an educator. Um, anything I missed, guys, or questions about the process? Nothing for me. Okay. okay. Yeah. So let's um, a little deeper into the a day of the life here. Jeremy, you want to walk us through? A, a week in the life. Yeah, well, I, I see this uh, question. Uh, mm -hmm. Are you going to, are you answering that one in the chat? About learning platform and all right, you got it. All right, um, I have, but please speak to it. Um, oh yes, there you there we go. Okay, yes, keep going. All right, I'm gonna talk about this example week with Kate. So uh, a week in the life of a consultant here. Let me go through this, or at least for us. Um, Monday, you have team check-ins. So I'm working on a project for PNG. We're talking about building a training for product supply. Who's doing what? We got this. What's the status of everything? And the second bullet is development. A lot of our work is putting words on a page. If you do not like to write, this is probably not the gig for you. Um, if you do not like to, like, I mean, I don't want to say in isolation, but there are hours of your time that you'll be, like, looking at all the interviews you did and synthesizing that. You'll be taking a lot of content they give you, and maybe it's horrible content, and you're like, I'm going to turn this into something awesome. And it is hours of restructuring and reimagining. And so that's development. Uh, Tuesday, you got a SME meeting. Oh, I'm meeting with someone in product supply about digitization. Because okay, there, there's going to be a, there's going to be a module on digitization. I've got to learn about that. Meet with the SME, take your notes. Uh, subject matter expert. Um, yes, the subject matter expert. So if I'm developing a training for product supply about digitization, They'll give me someone that I can learn that content from so I can build whatever I'm building. Wednesday, internal review. I've created something. Maybe it's an outline or a script or something. I'm going to have someone review it. Hey, what do you think? Good, bad, different? Like, indifferent? Like, what do you think? I'm going to hand it off to creative. They'll take what I've done with my words, and they will make something awesome visually. And that's, I love seeing our work come together. That's one of the things I never get to see as a teacher, really, because I'm not great with visuals. But when you think of visuals like a logo, like the Nike swoosh, we make that caliber of icons and logos for internal companies and initiatives. So hand off to creative, collaborate with the designer. Thursday, client review time, kick it over the fence with them, or we have a phone call. Hey, or hopefully, now we're getting in person more. Um, take a look at what we've done, blah, blah, blah. They have edits, uh, updating the line. And you're going to take that back. Like, okay, I got another edit. So I got to go do rework this, that, and the other. Friday, I'm going to take some time finalizing those updates, checking my thinking, and get beat up by the client. That's right. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, I'm going to say this: uh, not developing a thick skin. As a consultant, you are often offering ideas. They may be well received, and they may be so far off track that they will look at you like that is not what I was thinking. In that moment, you have to say, but I'm getting closer to what you want, right? So you always, we say, offering sacrificial ideas. Mm -hmm. um, so if you ever have, yeah, you have to hold loosely to some of your awesome ideas because they might not stick. Mm -hmm. So anyway, that's an example of weekly cadence. I'll pause there. Um, yes, high school students are tough. Uh, yes, they are. Yeah, they, other, they, they are. I just think that what Jeremy's saying is right. There's a mindset that you need to have, and it's really like if you focus on um, doing the best you can for the client, it's just like if you were trying to do the best you could for your students, you could sort of leave the ego behind, and it's like, how, what do I need to do to accomplish what I need to accomplish? And sometimes it's, you know, they see something that you think is awesome, and they're like, I hate it. I mean, they're never, well, they're not usually that fun. 
Um, it's rare, but you know, then you take that information and you learn from it and you refine what you're trying to do, and it makes you better. You know, it makes you think harder about you know how to make your design better. Um, I think also the way that we collaborate together challenges our thinking. So you know, we are all learning people by trade, but working with a creative person or a technology person mm-hmm. and having them challenge and push what it is that you're trying to do just makes the end result all that better. So I've definitely found that. Some other random, you know how sometimes you would agonize over lesson plans and other lesson plans, and so you agonize it, it's awesome, and then you can deliver it, it's horrible. It's just horrible. <laughs> you're like, this is going to be fabulous. <laughs> and other times you throw something together, literally like maybe an hour or two before, and it's amazing. <laughs> and like you're just like, that class was awesome. The same thing happens with this kind of work. Mm-hmm. I don't understand. Sometimes your team will get together and like the magic happens. You will create something so beautiful and amazing that impresses the client, and it took a few few hours. Other times you'll work days and months, and you deliver it, and you're like, oh, tepid reception at best. It's just one of the things you have to manage. All right, let's go on to, I think it's a daily routine. So that's, sure. that's what a week might look like. Um, a daily so, yeah, literally, what does your day look like? Um, it doesn't start with uh, kids and bells ringing. Um, it does start with usually you're getting up, there's email to manage, prepping, you're trying to figure out how do I prioritize my time for the day. You have team meetings. You have a lot of that dedicated work time. You're putting words on the page. You're reviewing the e-learning or the video that's been created with your words, with the visuals from creative. Um, you might have another uh, subject matter expert collab session. You're trying to get content from someone. Sometimes people hand you lots of content. Other times, you just have to pull it from their brain. More work time, team review, meeting with the team again, more work time. And I threw this in here. Our clients are all over the place. And so to get a time that's respectful for them, you might have a call with us, me in China at 7 o'clock at night. Or I had a call at 6 a.m. with some people. It was the only time they could do it. It was in Europe somewhere. It was super early for us, but kind of midday for them. So that's that's kind of what happens um, in the consulting world. Uh, your time is what matters. So uh, McDonald's sells hamburgers or Happy Meals or whatever. We sell our time as consultants. So every hour matters, and so I'm tra- I have to track my hours to know where it goes. Um, who, what, which client is paying for it. So that's an example of a daily schedule. Um, can I build on that? Yes, real quick? Okay, yeah. so one of the things I think t- that's important to note is so that um, some of us here on the call, we have children. And so we have flexibility to do what we need to do with our kids. Um, so if you need to get your child to school or to daycare or whatever it is, you know, your day might look different and everyone that you work with is respectful of that. It's It's really about like, you managing your calendar to be able to accomplish those things. I also will say, yes, you might occasionally have a call with China, but I wouldn't say that's an everyday thing. It's just, we're just trying to throw in there that like that occasionally could happen, um, and we meet our clients where we where they are. That's how, how we say that. So just wanted to put that out there. Yeah. That's a great right. build. Um, oh, yeah, Joe. No, I was going to say that this the same thing. This is a you know a, a, a what it might look like kind of calendar. I would say for the majority of folks, there's heavy work time happening between 10 a.m. and two, but there's also mm-hmm. a lot of work that gets done between five and seven a.m. and seven and 10 p.m. Uh, just related mm-hmm. to what you've got going on and what you're prioritizing, um, and I think a, a little bit different from from the the, the scholastic calendar um, is. Yeah. We can take personal time off whenever we want. And so uh, just a trend I've noticed um, at tier one is like one projects end and you just have less responsibility on your plate. It's like, I'm out, I'm taking three days off. It might be, you know, September for no reason, but it's just like, I got some time. I'm gonna take a breath. I'm gonna step away from work. I'm gonna come back and it's gonna ebb and it's gonna flow again. Um, definitely an adjustment. It's, it's, a, it's definitely a different calendar. Um, just, you know, and we're, we're talking to L&D, but just from like a tier one point of view, tier one is a great place for, we have holidays, you have however many holidays you, or whatever holidays you want. You've got a bucket of holiday hours. If opening day is a big holiday for you, great, take opening day off. If the day after the Super Bowl is a big holiday for you, make that a Super Bowl. You might be working on Labor Day or you might be working on, 
New Year's Day, but you know, you do what you need to do. So there's just a lot of flexibility and kind of understanding that if you aren't whole and you aren't functioning at the best of you, you're not going to be functioning as the best of, of a consultant. So I, right. I do miss my summer. Let's be clear. And just an ad. Yeah, <laughs> every, every summer I miss my summers. <laughs> yeah. Just an ad to say, of yeah. course, some of these things specific to holidays are tier one specific, not necessarily yes. yeah. instructional design specific. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right, so we're going to talk a little bit about skills that, that transfer here. Um, so, you know, quality learning is quality learning is quality learning. So we've talked a little bit about this. Uh, the basic process of, of development, Anna talked about specifically M1, um, you know, what's the problem we're trying to solve and how do we want to deliver that content? And depending on the scope of the engagement, do we have to, to dive into who is our audience? What do they already know? How we're going to assess them? Uh, and the activity types are often very, very similar. You know, when you talk about uh, actual interactive of learning, uh, you know, pair and share, tell me, show me, let me try uh, you know, strategies of like, hey, you guys are going to watch this video before you come to class and want, read that article before you come to class. And then when we get into this interactive session, we're going to go into some breakouts and we're going to talk about it. Um, you know, also e-learning, some kind of self-led learning. It, uh, the, the bad rap that e-learning gets, I think we'll see with the reactions here, but how many of you have taken those public school works, you know, slips, trips, and falls, bloodborne pathogen, those yearly, yeah, continuous education. So that's the worst version of that. We make some real, uh, what a recent client calls the Cadillac of e-learning, which I thought was cute because wouldn't it more be like a, like a Ferrari of e-learning nowadays? And Anyways, um, uh, you know, those e-learning courses, right? And then also just creating quality assessments. Um, how do we test, measure, and monitor that people learn what we wanted them to learn? So a lot of that stays very much the same. Um, so some skills specifically that translate and maybe kind of what the alternate version of that might be. So curriculum and lesson design, that becomes learning strategy and instructional design. We talked about this a little bit earlier, that learning strategy is kind of that higher level more abstract thinking that's kind of like developing the higher level curriculum your lesson design that's your your individual instructional design um you know your lesson development the actual creating that lesson development we might call that development as well but it's again it's more instructional design there lesson delivery um now this shows up not as front and stand and deliver you know sage on the stage that doesn't really show up very often that is the uh, is not a big part of what we do. And I think it's important to talk about that. If your favorite part of this uh, is that kind of get up and stand and deliver and kind of get some energy going in front of a room, that uh, you know, there's a, a big place for that in corporate L&D uh, where you can travel and you can be a facilitator and there's a high need for that type of thing. What that looks like in the consultant world is facilitation with clients, leading internal teams, um, you know, just generally trying to get everybody to come together from different points of view and collaborate and make this thing, whatever it might be, and move the ball forward. So it's a little bit different here. Going to pause. I just want to call one thing out, yeah, Joe. That yeah. you're, you're exactly right. Like, if you love that delivery of content and being in front of people, whether students or adults, plenty of those roles exist. Like full-time facilitators at different large companies um, that exists. I know people who have taken those roles. I know one person who just, that they, the onboarding orientation for new hires, they get a huge amount of new hires and every month, every week, they're training them. They get all this energy from it. So anyway, those roles are out there if you're really passionate about it. In our realm of consulting, we just, right now, we don't do that a whole lot. Zach, Anna, any other builds? Uh, yes, I would sir. say we often create the materials, but we're not the ones actually delivering it. All right. Um, teacher-based teams. Uh, you know, that's a, that's a big thing the past couple of years, those teacher-based teams. Every day you get together with a group of five, somebody's leading that team. You know, that's maybe some collaborative design sessions that happen internally. One of my favorite things to do, can't wait to do it again in real life, is get on the whiteboard with a couple of the creative strategists, uh, you know, user experience strategists, the tech strategists, the comm strategists. We all just got done, you know, digesting information discovery from the client for a couple of days and we all get in a room and we start to kind of jam on these ideas. Um, one of the differences, we're not necessarily boxed in by, oh, we, on third bell on Tuesdays when we have the teacher-based team, we can carve out a half day and bring in lunch and hang out and start the day and really like take our time to kind of sit and get deep in with the content. Um, let's see here. Uh, classroom leadership, again, client leadership, a, a big thing at tier one is internal and client leadership. Um, you know, listening, partnering with the client, 
not necessarily telling them what the right thing is, but hearing with them and working with them to try to create the solution that might best solve their, their current issue that they're having. Um, I think on here, team, any other builds on these? Yes, sir. I think that's been great. All right, so we got a question for the panel. Uh, Joe, if I may, yeah. ju just for the sake of time, I might skip this one so we can get to the Q&A. I think you've got one more. Sure, you know what, we to. already are there. That's a great call, great call. Um, so some moments that don't quite translate. Uh, and the reason we want to bring this up, Jeremy has said a couple kind of like, he's put some stakes in the ground. You need to love learning to do this, right? Um, you need to be a curious mind. You need to be in interested in writing. Uh, you need to be a writer. You got to put words on the page. I think it's it's good to kind of say what's really happening in learning and development in the world of consulting. Um, what we don't have are these. Uh oh, what's going on here with my animation? Uh, aha moments with learners. We're, we're not really having those aha moments with learners, but we do often have those aha moments with clients, and we do often have with each other when we're working together. I know I'll get stuck on a problem. Zach specifically is really good at visualizing complex things. It's, thinking of a way to simplify and visualize this. And I'll often go to Zach, hey, here's what I got. He doesn't have any idea what I'm talking about. I sketch this out, we're talking it through, and he helps me with the solution. Ah, I'm the one having the aha moment. But as far as like reaching a child, working with them day in and day out over several quarters or years often, and seeing that aha moment, that's not something that's really gonna happen. But it does happen in other ways. We're gonna see how much of an issue this animation is. Okay, good. Um, developing deep relationships with the learner. Very similar thing. That just isn't there. That day to day, I see you for an hour every day, and especially for like some of you, like language teachers, or music, or art, or PE teachers, where you teach the same kids for years. That just doesn't happen. Uh, but you do get to evolve fun client relationships. You do get to have team relationships. But if your thing is, um, you know, those deep student relationships, that that's not something that quite comes through. Again, you have client relationships. Jeremy shook his head when I said team and friend relationships. We've been seeing a lot of each other lately, um, so we'll, we'll, we can talk about that after the uh, after the workshop. Um, all right, rooms full of learners that upfront stand and deliver. We've talked about this a little bit. You occasionally get to do that. You are, happen to be on a call with a group of people who do, who do do this a fair amount. Um, I was told when I started at Tier One, hey, we don't do a lot of upfront facilitation. Um, I happen to being a teacher and being I'm a, also a performer and musician. Um, and, and comfortable in front of a crowd. So we often find ourselves in this situation, but you do get to run design sprints. You get to do team facilitation. You do get to do something like that. Uh, it's different, but uh, again, if your thing is that leading rooms for learners, maybe a corporate L&D thing is more up your alley. Uh, that daily iteration and testing, that lesson creation and then deliver it and then do it again, or maybe over the bells, something that doesn't really happen either, um, but you do get to do some team and, and collaborative design uh, and one thing that I really liked about working the work professional LDs, I'm no longer designing on an island. It used to just be me, especially I was a music teacher. So it was me doing my stuff. And I might send it to another friend who's a music teacher, but it was me. What's awesome now is you get to create something generally with other people and then have a different person go, hey, just read this and give me a reaction. Uh, Anna specifically is really good at staffing team uh, with people with different expertise to just like zoom in, look at things, drop your point of view, some experience, react, and then zoom out. So recently I have a lot of experience with video and scrappy video editing and kind of a point of view on video. And um, Anna brought me into a project for maybe eight hours. I reviewed some client videos. I was on some client conversations. I got to bring some fresh ideas to the table and here's the, kick some things around. And then I zoomed right out of that project and went back to some other things. That I find really exciting, uh, but definitely that daily iteration of and testing of your lesson and seeing the outcome of your lesson doesn't happen. Um, uh, Jeremy, I think I've learned from Jeremy is that you got to sell post pilot edits. We need to watch you do it. And then we need to make a bunch of notes of what we want to fix because we're just guessing. We, you know, we have got a lot of experience, but we go by a lot of gut. Like this might work. Oh, with this audience. So we had a, uh, we delivered last week, two weeks ago to, it was a global audience, a lot of South Asians, um, mostly Europeans, but like a lot of South Asians. And some of the things that we did just with this audience just didn't land a little bit. We had to just, we had to reorient because the previous workshop, similar line of work was to a bunch of uh, early hires. So it's like, we had to just kind of twist what we were doing. And we learned a lot, a lot of really cool things that we were then able to apply in the next version of that. Um, I think that's my last one there team. Yeah, oh, daily prep. That grind, the day-to-day -day grind is not 
what, what is there is a much longer term project. Um, one of the first projects I was on with, with luckily with Zach was with a major steel manufacturer and it was like a, a very long project, but I was able to be on it for like nine months. Um, imagine being a teacher working on a two day training and then some other, you know, post work for six to nine months. So we really generated an amazing, amazing thing there. So um, any ads or builds from the team here? And we're gonna get to the Q&A. Okay. I just built it in the chat, that's all. Oh, okay. No, you're good, you're good. Oh, you guys got it, all right. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, that, uh, the day-to-day -day grind is, is really tough. Um, there's a certain, there's a different grind, of course. Every job has its thing. Right. Um, but uh, I would say, Leaning on a lot of other really smart, fun, functional people helps helps you get through. You can lean on others. So we're going to move on here. And I think, uh, Jeremy, you're going to talk us through a little bit about a bit more about Yeah. Hey, uh, of course, we are coming from the consulting perspective of Tier 1. So just a couple of slides about Tier 1, um, because if it were some other company, they'd be talking about their fifth, third bank or their P&G or whatever. So Tier 1, just a couple of slides about Tier 1. Founded in 2002, so my goodness, we're 18, 19 years in. Different locations you see there. I think we're probably over 260 people now. Um, employee owned and uh, a certified B Corp, which you could look those things up. It's good for business, good for the planet, good for all this stuff, good for profits, right? Um, and then we look at uh, our overall strategies. What does tier one do? This sounds like corporate speak or jargon. We activate strategy. What does that mean? Well, the company wants to do X, we are going to help you do that through your people. We're going to consult. What do you want to do? How are you thinking about it? What do you, what's your vision? We're going to design the experience, whatever that is, or series of experiences. And then we're going to build what's necessary for that experience. That could be, uh, we've talked about this, e-learning or videos or instructor-led trainings. And I remember early on, one of my first learnings was companies pay you to like write facilitator guides and participant guides. Like, and I'm like, Yes, they do, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, it's a huge value add for them. Um, okay, keep going. Uh, consult design build, yes. Uh, our disciplines, my gosh, we're, this is what I love about tier one. I love, I'm primarily in the learning space, but I work with people in communications or technology or creative. By creative, we mean all of the visuals that, um, that people do. Uh, change management, there's this whole field of like, a company is going through a massive change how do you lead them through that change? What does that look like? And it's all these disciplines coming together where our solutions are at their best. And so it's, it's just, this is a, it's, it's also great to see when you share a curriculum with someone who's in change or comms or tech and they have an idea and you're like, I would have never thought of that because they think way differently. And it makes your solution that much stronger. Um, so anyway, love our disciplines. That's how, kind of how we operate. This is our, sh all companies everywhere, for-profit, non-profit, industry agnostic, we're all over the place uh, when it comes to our clients. Um, next slide, uh, uniquely tier one. Oh, Joe, what is this? It's a surprise. <laughs> so um, yeah, we'll just talk about each one of these things. I kind of assigned you guys a task here. So Anna, tell us about okay. Okay. the nature of our culture. <laughs> Okay, I'll try to be quick. I've talked a little bit about this, but the idea that we're highly collaborative. So that little Adam um, image that Jeremy just shared, the idea that all of our disciplines come together in, in each situation, we figure out what's the right skill blend and we work together to come up with a common vision for that client. And then we all work together to bring it to life. So that's largely how we do our work. And then in terms of internal expertise, I mean, we've got people from all walks of life, different backgrounds. Zach has a background in psychology, which I didn't know that until today. <laughs> uh, Jeremy has a background in teaching in Spanish and uh, MBA. So, like, we all just have different expertises that we can draw upon, which is wonderful because if you are in a situation with a client where there's something new that's tossed your way, chances are someone else in the company has done something with that that you can then pull in and leverage um, and then you learn something new, too. Like the other day, I learned about user experience design for websites. I've never done that before, and now I have a little bit more knowledge about it. So that's that's what I'll say about collaboration. Absolutely. And team, just to say, this is our last slide, and then we'll go to Q&A. But yep. I want to be transparent. We we do want you half 
here to get value in learning about the field outside of teaching, but we're also interested in recruiting you to Tier 1. So I'll say with pride, dynamically distributed authority is, is a term that we use inside of Tier 1. It's proprietary. It's just as our operating structure, and it's our way of saying we're very flat, um, we're very um, empowered to kind of own our own schedule, own our own projects. So there's no manager that I report to. Everything I do is through project teams. Um, people do check my thinking, but we have this principle that says whoever's closest to the client makes the call. So it's not at all that we're based on level or seniority. It really is that we're based on the ideas that we bring to the table and something that we love the most. My turn. Uh, own your own career. Uh, you know, tier one is a, a real meritocracy. Um, if you have a thing that you're really passionate about, there's a space to, to pursue that. And I think that that's really cool. Um, you will see that that the people that do great work are in demand. And when you're in demand, you have choice. You're able to go like, not so interested in that, very interested in that. That's not to say there aren't moments where it's like, hey, we really need you to do this thing. Sure. It is, um, you know, if you bring it to the table, that gets honored and you get an idea, push that idea. Um, ah, Zach learned uh, meritocracy. It's a musical. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, I think I learned it from a comedian, I'll be honest with you. Uh, so yeah, I, I really I like that. And, um, you know, for me, I've been really interested in um, video, scrappy video, and I've just found through conversation ways to get involved with that, that kind of work. And whenever it comes my way, excited to, to jump in on that so I do like that aspect and of course fun Jeremy. Hey it's one of our core values and I will say that just the other day I started meeting with hey let's get weird that's right let's do, let me tell you something then you meet people in companies they need some stuffy environments they need some life they need some energy they need some humor most of them appreciate it and some people I never get clients I never get invited back. That's fine too. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, keep clients clients coming back forward. Some people they have hard jobs. They have really lots of pressure on them. We want to have fun with them and get the work done, like exceeding their expectations. So um, yeah, keep them coming back for more. You can be yourself. I mean, uh, earn some credibility first, and then let's get weird. <laughs> uh, we just had a client that even said like the the reason I wanted to go with you guys is we had short interaction and it was really fun and there was nobody else that worked because I just, I saw the camaraderie immediately. Um, all right, um, we'll jump right back to this. If you are interested in, in tier one or continue the conversation, um, you know, send questions, your resume or a request for a chat to jobs at tier one performance. Um, we'll go ahead and in the chat for everybody. Um, but we want to, we want to get to the, to the Q and A here. So uh, really what is, is on, on your mind? Uh, what questions do you have? Um, I do not have a hard stop so I can keep going. Um, so, Shame. I'm okay. Shame too. Yeah. And you, honestly, you don't have to use the chat. You can just come on mic if you want. Yeah. Um, well, I, I love what I'm hearing. Um, I love the, I love creating lesson plans, delivering, designing. I love being an educator, but you know, of course I'm obviously here because I'm looking for a change. So in that change, what, and, and as I apply and, and do all these things, what are you guys looking for um, in a cover letter or on a resume that really would would kind of differentiate a person for a job like this? That's a great question. You're on this call, you're showing interest. If your resume is like, if you reach out and say, I just wanna have a conversation, I would have a conversation, but your specific resume, okay. What do you love about teaching? How does that show up? What's the, what's the different experiences you, that you've done in teaching? What kind of results has that led to? Um, I would think like other things, if it's well-written, it's organized, like parallelism with bullets and all this stuff, like that kind of stuff matters. Uh, I don't know, what, do you guys, what would you guys yeah, say? That's, that's true. Go ahead, sir. Well, I'd just add to a lot of times, even beyond a resume, we'll ask for just kind of examples of some of your work. And it doesn't matter what it is. Obviously, we know you're not building a course uh, for PayCore on I-9 documentation, but just seeing the way you think as expressed through kind of artifacts of your work helps us out a lot, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. um, I would I go a, a little different route, which is just do a little homework, show up prepared. Um, it's, if you look at our website, it's a little ambiguous what Tier 1 does. It takes a minute to figure it out. <laughs> You know, learn a little bit about the the world of L and D, and get on LinkedIn, do some snooping, meet some people, because um, really our our hiring process is not 
one interview and you're great. It's, it's a series of many conversations, with a variety of folks poking and prodding. You might be applying for a job, but it's like, as we talk, like, where might this person fit? Oh, they have a really interesting skill set. Oh, that might work over here or work over there. Um, but and kind of just doing some homework and being prepared for those conversations. Mm -hmm. I think also just being yourself, but you have to have, um, you know, just a confidence in your experience and what you bring to the table. I think that's important too, because as a consultant, our clients look to us to have a point of view and you all have education degrees and that has a lot of value. And like we've said, it does translate. So having that confidence in, you know, you know what great learning looks like. You've done this for years. You've seen it play out. You've crafted experiences. And what I will say is that a lot, I mean, obviously the, the people here on the call all have teaching backgrounds. And beyond us, we have several other educators in our company who have been wildly successful. So we know that teaching backgrounds and experience have a lot of value in our environment. So that's part of why we think it will be um, – great to see if there are other educators that we can bring on board. We think that's uh, a formula for success. And I've always kind of thought like there's a secret sauce for like anybody who has crafted experiences, mm -hmm. delivered them, seen it play out and understand like what I'm doing right now is going to affect my learners in a certain way, seeing that, you know, observing that and then learning from it. Um, and that's something that you will have that someone that comes out of, School, but you know, maybe doesn't have that experience, they don't have that advantage. That's right. Uh, Thank you. A, another little quick add I think that one of the things that, that Tier One appreciates is diversity of viewpoints. Um, mm -hmm. We're not looking to bring in 45 people who have instructional design degrees who all went to the same college. The, the different heads and the more heads that with different points of view that we can get into the room the more creative and innovative ideas, the more holes we can go, oh, that's a hole, that's a hole. Um, if we have mm -hmm. in the same way, we're gonna miss a lot. Mm -hmm. That's right. Joe, Nicole's got one in the chat there for us. Yeah, uh, when you first came to tier one, what might've been something shocking or new that you had not experienced being an educator before? Um, that's a great question. Um, I would say just there's a certain amount of just business corporate, speak attitude work style lifestyle it's way different than the world of education um the mm -hmm. pace um it, it's just the demand is, was for me was like a higher faster um that i was definitely it was for me i really enjoyed it i was like all right let's do this but uh, <laughs> definitely like that was, that was new for me i, I was self-employed and then a teacher um so i, I knew mm -hmm. you know else good one. well when I joined the company, it was years ago, and we were much smaller then. I think I was employee number 23. And so we were, were all wearing multiple hats. And one of the hats I had to wear was um, answering the phone, <laughs> which I was never, like, I, I, I was awful at it. So I used to, like, be, you know, working and cut people off by accident, whatever. You don't have to do that anymore because we have, like, grown and we've got that. But it was just different for me because I, I was having to – just stretch myself, wear different hats, and um, learn how business works. Like, I think that's one of the things, like they, um, Joe was just saying, like the business acumen part of it. I had a lot to learn mm -hmm. in that space because, yeah, as an educator, I didn't really have, like, understanding of, like, financial models and business models and how that all plays out and how the work that we do supports a business and being successful. So, like, that was all a learning curve for me. Mm -hmm. Jeremy, you want to expand upon your three? Uh, lack of assessment. Uh, expectations are high. Yeah, uh, just in our world, uh, the, the idea that another company is hiring a consulting firm. They either A, don't have the skills, or B, don't have the capacity, or both. So the expectations sometimes are, are high, and I think you've got to deal with that, uh, a certain amount of pressure, and when it all goes well, great, and when it doesn't, there's a certain amount of pressure with that. So uh, the other thing is just, I mentioned before, time. Um, you're, you're expected in our environment. You're a, like, like a lawyer, you've heard of billable hours. We have to bill our hours. So you're tracking your time every day. And at the end of the week, you're submitting a time card that goes into the world of our finance folks, and they bill out that, our clients for that. 
And so there's a certain responsibility that, to, to know that, okay, I'm not goofing around because a client's paying the company $200 an hour for that. Mm-hmm. It's kind of like you got to be mindful of that. Mm-hmm. So that was something different from teaching. Mm-hmm. Just to build off of what Joe had said earlier about the meritocracy piece of it too, like, yes, yeah, so if, you, if you do a great job, all kinds of opportunities come your way, and you have to also be a good steward of your time and protect your priorities, and that means managing your time. And so, you know, things like, you know, family obligations and the things that you, you want to ensure that you save time for, you have to just be proactive in how you manage your calendar. And you learn those things, and you learn how to do that. You learn tips from people around you, but it's something that you have to – it's a skill that you have to build yeah, if you're great, great. There is always work. Yeah. And it, they, you can be working all the time, and you don't want to find yourself like. Well, that's the thing. It's exciting, but you gotta at some point be like, okay, can I take this? And yeah, yeah exactly. I didn't mean it's to cut you. <laughs> yeah. Um, uh, all right. Recording project. So, oh, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. I was gonna close her up, but we got another question. Oh, recruited project. So staffing. We get projects that are sold, account managers, solution architects, sell a deal. Who is going to be on that project? And there's a conversation that happens. We think this person would be a good fit because for this reason. We think that person. And that's how it happens. What happens with a new hire is you're often like, can you work on this small thing, like an outline or like this or that? And what another thing that shocked me, six to 12 months in, all of a sudden it's like, hey, can you show up at this client meeting and just meet with them and then we'll build a solution? And I'm like... I was just outlining six months ago, but like if you deliver on the little things, all of a sudden the opportunities hit you fast and they're, they get bigger yeah. quickly. You build momentum. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, we are a, a, a people services business. So um, yeah. people definitely, our clients recruit us and they may ask for certain team members. And internally at Tier 1, if you're in a consultancy, you will get recruited to projects to do certain types of work. So mm-hmm. absolutely. Yeah. And, and you get just, kind of known for things. I was going to say, ahead, no, 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 just a note about relationships. If you start to have a relationship and that person comes back from more work, you've got the relationship. So you're going to go back to that job to kind of help manage that relationship. But there is a, you know, there's a studio system. There's an official process for, for hiring or not hiring, but for staffing projects and things. But I, like we, I think everybody has said, if, you, if you're known for a thing, um, you, either, the, the kind of line cues up for you to, to get you to do that thing. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, any other, other questions here? These were great. Um, all right, well, thank everybody so much. This was kind of a pilot for us. This was the first one that we have done of this. So there will presumably be more of these. Um, I'll put that email address back in the chat. Um, that is certainly a great way to, to reach out and to try to get to know us. Um, and uh, if you don't have any other questions, thank you so much, everybody. Really appreciate your time. Uh, and really appreciate the interaction here. This was, this was really fun for me, so. Mm-hmm. And, and Joe, if I can just add really quickly, I want to be clear that, that that email inbox is just to make sure nothing gets missed. So in the end, you'll probably end up speaking to one of us. If you want to connect, just ask questions. There's, it, don't make it seem too formal just because it's a kind of a separate inbox. We'd love to hear from you guys. Hey, it's summer. It's after 8 o'clock. <laughs> it's warm out. Go enjoy your summer. Thanks so much for joining us. Yep. All right. Bye, everybody. Nice to meet you all. Have a good night. Bye. Take care.